alien conspiracy and abductions aren't anything new, but with the government openly admitting to having divisions that investigate UFO, or as they're referred to now, UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, it's a great time to look at the purported true story of Travis Walton and his buddies, who in 1975 came across a UFO and Travis was allegedly taken for five days. The book The Walton Experience was released in the late 70s, and it took until 1993, the same year The X-Files premiered, for the film adaptation Fire in the Sky to be released. The movie received mostly good reviews, but only made $19 million on its $4 million budget, while eventually earning a cult following. While it's pure science fiction in nature, it has a tinge of horror to it, one scene in particular. How does the movie fare with Walton's own account of his harrowing event? Watch the skies as we <laughs> probe and find out what the f*** really happened to this horror movie. Travis Walton was eventually able to get his book made into a movie, and decided to release the book with the name of the upcoming film to tie it in better. The chosen director, Robert Lieberman, had only done TV up to this point, and when given the chance, spoke with writer Tracy Torme on how best to approach the story. While Torme had gotten his start as a writer on SNL of all things, he's also written for things like sci-fi TV epic Star Trek The Next Generation, and a few UFO-based properties like the TV documentary UFO Cover-Up, and the Richard Crenna TV series Intruder, which was also about alien abduction. Probably the coolest notch on his belt is being the creator of the TV show Sliders. For the record, neither of them thought Walton was telling the truth, with Lieberman stating that he thought Walton was smarter than his friends, and the group almost certainly got carried away after lacing their own beers one night. The movie would have a 90s all-star cast, with the post-Terminator 2 and pre-X-Files Robert Patrick, E.T.'s own Henry Thomas, future big-time director Peter Berg, Nightbreed's Craig Sheffer, and D.B. Sweeney as the main character, Travis. D.B. Sweeney wasn't the director's first choice to play Travis, but he was told with so little time until filming that it was either Sweeney or the movie wasn't happening. In addition to the main cast, you had character actor great Noble Willingham as the small town of Snowflake, Arizona sheriff, and Oscar-nominated Hollywood old-timer James Garner as the special investigator, Lieutenant Walters. The cast blends together well, with Patrick and Sweeney having great chemistry as best friends, while Garner is a standout who never believes the alien abduction story, and even considers it a murder case before Walton shows up five days after. But how well did the behind-the-scenes team, a team that didn't believe the story was true at all, do in having the film follow the quote-unquote real Travis account? The movie opens up with what we'd assume is some sort of extraterrestrial light shining down a highway that actually turns out to be a truck speeding its way towards a bar. It almost causes an accident with a semi-truck before parking and having five men enter the bar in a stunned silence until agreeing to stick to the story and call the cops. The local police arrive with a special investigator played by James Garner. Walters begins to question them as to what happened to their friend Travis. Well, right off the bat we can see the creative liberties the screenwriter and director took to make the story their own. In addition to there being seven men in the real-life story including Travis, as opposed to the six total depicted in the film, the men went looking for Travis after the supposed abduction first, but in the film it's just Walton's best friend, Mike, played by Robert Patrick, who goes back to look. The men then go on to tell the story of the abduction, with all of them working a long day to finish a job so they can get paid, and when they leave that night, they see what they assume is the lights of a downed airplane. The plane turns out to be a UFO, with Travis getting out and going to investigate. He's entranced by a light coming from the ship, and the rest of the men get scared and leave. Walters doesn't believe the story at all, and pressures them into admitting a murder happened before they all agree to go looking for Travis the next morning. They don't find any traces of Travis or the UFO, but hold steadfast in their story that it was a UFO and not a murder. Well, the men have mostly different names and personalities, but this is how the events transpired. There's also no special lieutenant that came to investigate either. It was just the sheriff and the sheriff's deputy that took the men's statements and then gathered a search party to go look for the missing Travis. A member of AFAR, or the American Foundation for Aerial Research, approaches Mike to discuss the abduction and the town begins to gossip and turn on the group of men. The men also turn on each other a little bit as tensions rise when Travis still doesn't turn up. Travis's brother-in-law threatens to hold Mike and his crew personally responsible and most of the town agrees with Walters that the men murdered Travis, especially since one of them, Dallas, was hostile towards him at points and has a criminal record. Mike defends himself and the rest of the crew in front of the whole town during a meeting and openly agrees that they will all take a polygraph test to prove they're telling the truth. Well, the book is told from Travis's perspective, so much of the comings and goings in the small town were made for the screen to create more drama for the audience to hold on to. 
The near fight in the restaurant and the drama between the crew were set up by the writer, who was a good creator of human drama within their sci-fi shows, and that helped shape the rest of the narrative more than just what the book was about, especially with the writer not really believing Walton in the first place. The men all take the lie detector test after a conversation that they have with worries of being set up to fail before the sheriff assures them that the man administering the test can be trusted. The tests come back inconclusive, and the men are all told that they have to come back to retake them the following day, but refuse, as they did what they were told to do to get the pressure and assumptions off of them. Later that same night, Mike receives a phone call from someone claiming to be Travis, and they want to be picked up. Mike and many of the friends and family drive down to the gas station payphone where the call was made to find a very disoriented but alive Travis naked and cowering in a corner. They get some clothes on him, and he's a bit bruised but seems okay while downing as much water as humanly possible. The man from afar bursts in to get the story and pictures, but they end up taking Travis to the hospital instead. In reality, lie detector tests were indeed administered, but they all passed except for Dallas, who just refused to take the test, all due to his criminal record. They weren't asked to take the tests again, and the sheriff decided that then and there, the men must be telling the truth, and the abduction was deemed real. Travis did in fact call from a payphone for help, but instead of phoning his best friend Mike, he instead called his brother-in-law to say he needed help and to come get him. Both of these were almost certainly changed because they wanted to give the Walters character reason to not trust Dallas with his inconclusive test, and because Mike was a much bigger focal point in the film than the brother-in-law was. They immediately take Travis to the hospital, where he goes in and out of consciousness and sees glimpses of his ordeal on the spaceship. He isn't speaking to anyone and is clearly trying to piece together what happened when he finds out from Mike that he and the logging crew left him to die that night. Walters confronts Travis about what happened, but Travis simply tells him that he can't remember and he's still very confused by everything that's been going on. Back at a homecoming party, Travis passes out and begins to remember everything that happened after the light from the ship. The real-life Travis wasn't taken to the hospital right away, and authorities weren't immediately notified, which spurred more voices to believe that it was a hoax. Also, Travis would tell anyone and everyone who would listen to him on what he claimed happened that night, rather than holding it in and being introspective. Travis's brother Dwayne called a UFOologist that he remembered told him that when Travis returned, he would set up a medical exam, but they later found out it was not going to be with a doctor, but with a hypnotherapist. They refused, and the UFOologist became one of the many to refute Travis's claim. The movie then shows us what we've all been waiting for, with the big spectacle done up by ILM where we see what Travis went through. He wakes up with a liquid running into his mouth while he is trapped in some sort of organic encasement with what looks like turkey stuffing on the ground. He's able to claw his way out only to find himself in a large cylindrical room with a very different gravity. He works his way around and discovers that there are other bodies and other flesh cases with varying degree of deterioration to them. He climbs up and finds spacesuits that look like the stereotypical gray men aliens we've all heard about before being startled by an actual little green man. He thinks he's finally escaped but is pulled away by a few of them and placed on a table by two aliens that have almost human skin tone and extremities. They strip him and strap him to a table and cover him with a sheet that has almost saran wrap-like ability to wrap him to the table. He screams, but his head is covered by the same sheet and his mouth is filled with something that gags him before he's poked and prodded and a liquid put in his eye to kind of knock him out. The real Travis account is wildly different from what the filmmakers put together. Real life Walton says that the light from the ship almost traveled through him before he passed out and woke up in a chair with a bright light above his head. He was surrounded by little gray aliens in orange suits and while he hurt all over, he attempted to fight his way out of the room, using a tube as a bat to scare the aliens away. He then walked down a hallway that led to a planetarium-like room where he sat in a single chair and looked upon multiple stars and galaxies before moving a joystick-like contraption on the chair that would rotate his view of the ceiling. After he got up, he wandered down another hall and felt a presence behind him that ended up being another human who would not answer any of his questions. He had large gold eyes, a blue jumpsuit, and a glass helmet, and yet Travis still thought to trust him. They walked past a hangar of sorts and into a room with other humans before a gas mask was placed on Travis, and he blacked out again, only to awake in that phone booth. He would also later claim that he tried to take control of the craft and fly his way home. Movie Travis wakes up in an office, and then the film fast forwards to a few years later with Travis married to Mike's sister, and having a small child and another on the way, while Mike has gone into seclusion after his own divorce. The two men make amends, and a scroll goes on the screen that says that Travis is still married and has four children, while also being the foreman in Snowflake where the events took place. It also says an additional polygraph was administered to Mike, Travis, and Dallas, where they all passed this time. 
The personal details of Travis's real life are hard to look up as he keeps much of it, well, personal. But the truth is he failed multiple tests before passing a few others. It was also said by some of the administrators that Travis knew how to cheat the test in order to make it look like he was telling the truth. While the book and Travis's story have been a major talking point for over 40 years, the movie is a cult classic and somewhat of a hidden gem. The movie differs quite a lot from Travis's account of what he claims happened to him during those five days, but most people that have read the book and seen the film seem to prefer the movie. Give both a chance if you're interested in the subject, and always remember to keep watching the skies. Mm -hmm.